Hudson Institute. My name is Peter Rao. I'm a senior fellow here at Hudson, and it's my pleasure to moderate today's discussion on Iranian drone and missile proliferation. What are Iran's ambitions? I'm joined by three wonderful colleagues today. John Kasapalu is a non-resident senior fellow at Hudson. He's joining us from Berlin. It's a late hour there, so thanks for joining us, John. But ordinarily, he comes to you from Istanbul, um, which is rather appropriate because it uh, very symbolically bridges both Asia and Europe. And here we have a regional power in Iran, which is uh, actively supporting Russia and uh, arming the Russians in their campaign in Ukraine. I'm also joined by Luke Coffey, also a senior fellow at Hudson Institute, who joined us recently from the Heritage Foundation, where he directed the Allison Center uh, for years. He's an expert on Europe and Eurasia also straddles both the Middle East and Europe uh, and has a great geopolitical wisdom to dispense, which I'm looking forward to hearing. And last but certainly not least, uh, Mike Duran, who uh, is a veteran analyst of the Middle East and directs our Center on Middle Eastern Peace and Security. So uh, if you want to learn more about uh, all three of these colleagues, please visit Hudson.org. We have a new website uh, and you can read all about their work and their many offerings and publications and other events at Hudson.org. To get us started, I thought I would go to you, John, and uh, ask you about um, really the military technical aspects of the Iranian defense industrial base. They're supplying the Russians. This has made top line news. And I think any analyst or any interested reader, or anyone watching this event who's followed the war in Ukraine can't help but have noticed that uh, Iranian drones and, and potentially missiles are, are present there. But for a lot of us, I think our eyes glaze over when we hear about these various systems and drones. So maybe just help uh, situate us to get us started on what we're talking about and what we're dealing with for the non-technical audience. Thank you, Peter, and hello, everyone. Well, actually, we are dealing with two certain systems that we know they are deployed by the Russians. Interestingly, some of them are deployed in Belarus, and they are, they are launched from Belarus uh, to pound Ukraine, including the capital, Kiev. What we certainly know by open source intelligence is first we have Shahid the 136 loitering munitions. Uh, loitering munitions is actually in, in the pop culture, it is it is a kamikaze drone that it directly homes in on its target and it carries an organic warhead. Uh, so it detonates the target with itself. So there is no return back from a, an accomplished mission. It has uh, 40 kilograms of warhead. It is not a bunker buster. It is not a penetrator. So the Ukrainians who shelter in bunkers should be safe. Uh, but the problem is uh, modern air defense systems, including the ones that the Ukrainians have, are not designed to intercept uh, those loitering munitions because of two things. First, they have a, a very problematic uh, radar signature. And second, uh, um, trying to civilianize the, the, the terminology here, but the, the, the key word is ground clutter. So detection of these drones are really not easy for conventional air and missile defense systems, which are not suitable, are, are not built uh, for intercepting them. Uh, so second, we have a more, say, conventional uh, asset, uh, a Mohajer 6. Uh, Mohajer is an interesting one because it also reflects the strategic direction of Iran's drone proliferation because the baseline started as an ISR, like intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance asset. And over the past years, we have seen a gradual shift from being an intelligence, merely actually intelligence, intelligence platform into a strike platform. And it carries uh, Iran-made uh, smart munitions, gliding munitions, Made for uh, made for this platform, it is a, what we call male class or medium uh, class uh, the weapon system. It has the the altitude that 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 allows him uh, allows it to to uh, fly over the MAMPAT's engagement range, uh, and this is really important because at bottom line geopolitically, Iran became a drone supplier to the world's second largest arms exporter. Uh, and Iran became a, a weapon system supplier to an active Russian invasion uh, of European territory. Uh, so I think this, this is, if, if you want me to, to rate uh, from zero to 10 in terms of geopolitical magnitude, I would say this is at least a nine 
in terms of its in, in terms of its importance. And then uh, maybe just to follow up on one question, which uh, which I, I've noticed in the news, and it it took me back to a quote from Don Rumsfeld years ago that the uh, the cost of intercepting these with what the West has available to it. Um, far surpasses the cost of producing one of these on, on the Iranian side. Is that correct? It takes me back, as I, as I said, to I'm paraphrasing, but the Rumsfeldian adage that, you know, you can send a multi-million dollar missile at a camel in, in, uh, in, in the Middle East, and it's not really a good bang for your buck uh, from an American, American point of view. But actually, that's right. And I think that's right in, in two dimensions. One is the defense economics and defense technological and industrial base dimension that you mentioned. For each dollar that the Iranians spend, not only on loitering munitions, but also on conventional drones and also missile systems, both ballistic and, and cruise missiles, uh, any, defensive, uh, any defensive party has to spend uh, unprecedented more, uh, incomparably more money uh, to, to have an adequate system, a reliable system uh, to in intercept those. And even at good interception rates, which I would say like 80% or 90% interception rate is really magic, like really something that is that is unimaginable. Uh, because in terms of interceptions, we are talking about like, if it is over 50%, 60%, then you have a reliable system, you have a good system, but think it that way. The target set, the Russian, Russians are very interested in the following Iranian footsteps in the Middle East. The target set is as important as, as the weapon system itself. And the Russians are using these drones as first attacking critical national infrastructure. It, it profoundly affected uh, Ukraine's electricity infrastructure by a few salvos, and also as weapons of terror. Uh, so even a few small numbers of leaks that go unintercepted, they can cause uh, enormous damage to, to, to these, like both society uh, as a weapon of terror and also critical national infrastructure. So both in, ter in terms of defense planning and defense economics, uh, definitely these kind of systems favors the offensive side. Do, do the Iranians have hundreds of these, thousands, dozens? I mean, is there any estimate on the sheer numbers that they might be able to provide the Russians? Well, that's the that's million dollar question. And that's actually what, what should make us more uncomfortable about that because Iran became becoming a drone supplier to the Russian Federation in an ongoing war, which is a high tempo war. Uh, and Iran becoming that drone supplier to the second largest arms exporter uh, of the world uh, under sanctions and with limited ability to reach international high technology market because we know that some of these drone subsystems like GPS systems or GLONASS systems like their cameras are dual use uh, and Iran either smuggled them in or commercially bought them by using mid parties. And this is a, a really complicated uh, global network of uh, subsystem smuggling and sub subsystems procurement operations. Uh, we know that the Iranians have them in large numbers so that they are able to sustain a broad network of proxies from the Lebanese Hezbollah to the Houthi militia in Yemen. But Iran supporting an interstate war, a very high operational tempo one, and being able to do that uninterrupted up until now is really alarming for us. It is, it is really worrisome for us. One thing to, I think, highlight here is this. We, the US strategic community, NATO strategic community, tend to treat Iran as a Middle Eastern threat. Uh, but it is that the Iranian weapon systems are right at NATO's eastern flank right now in the European territory. So I think it, it also challenges that, that dichotomy in mind. But coming back all to your question, do they have them in hundreds, in thousands? I think they have in higher numbers that, than we estimated that they are, they are able to sustain uh, these supplies right now. A nice transition about the linkages between the regions. Um, and while I want to come back to you later about some of the missile systems that are now being talked about and floated, uh, let's go to Luke. Luke, I, I promised our viewers geopolitical wisdom, which you were going to dispense with. So um, uh, Sean started getting into some of those elements. Perhaps you can talk about the geopolitics of Iran now fighting essentially uh, uh, you know, an, an American and NATO allies supported war 
uh, in Ukraine. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, we, we often take a very narrow cartographer's view of the world. And, you know, we, we often think of Iran um, as a Middle Eastern actor or a, a, an actor sometimes in, uh, in Central Asia. But the truth is Iran uh, considers itself uh, to be one of the established powers in Eurasia. And the fact that it is now supporting Russia, which, you know, uh, historically, going back hundreds of years, uh, you know, the Imperial Russian Empire and Persia were often at odds with one another, but now they've, in recent years, have found common ground. Uh, the fact that Iran is supporting Russia in its uh, invasion of Ukraine really should come as no surprise, considering the current uh, geopolitical situation. Uh, you know, Russia has something that Iran needs, cash. At least right now, Russia has cash from the reserves that Putin hoarded leading up to the uh, the invasion last February, and and Iran has something Russia needs: uh, drones, ballistic missiles, and the military technology that's associated with that. So, in, in many ways, uh, the, the two are benefiting one another for their own uh, national interests. Now, I think that there'll be a number of lessons learned here that will apply beyond just Ukraine and also come back to the Middle East. Uh, it is likely that Ukraine will soon be the country in the world, even surpassing Israel, that has the most practical experience dealing with Iranian drones. So there will be a lot of countries in, in the Gulf, uh, even including Israel the, in the Middle East, who will want to learn these lessons that Ukraine has been learning the hard way. And so even if publicly uh, certain countries are saying that they're not going to be working with Ukraine with uh, its defense or they don't want to be provocative to Russia, so they're going to keep an arm's distance away from uh, the, the war in Ukraine. I can guarantee behind the scenes there'll be uh, military officials, uh, technical officials, uh, in industry officials in the Middle East who will want to get their hands on this first hand knowledge that Ukraine is gathering in terms of deterring and defeating this Iranian drone threat. And with every uh, drone attack that Russia launches using an Iranian ballistic missile or an Iranian drone, the Ukrainians will become that much more capable in deterring the next attack. And it will be, a, it will be a, unfortunately a very um, bloody process, uh, especially as Chan mentioned, the target set uh, tends to be uh, critical infrastructure and civilian targets in uh, built up areas uh, of uh, built up populated areas. Uh, and so the, the terror aspect of these drones and the lessons that the Ukrainians will be learning will come at a high cost, unfortunately. Uh, one, one observation on the target set, I do find it interesting or, or maybe curious that at a time when Russian forces appear to be on the on the back foot, at least in Kherson, and also still around Kharkiv, that Russia would prioritize this campaign of terror using these loitering munitions instead of trying to support the frontline units that are engaged in a defensive operation against the, the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, maybe this means that Vladimir Putin thinks that he can um, bomb the Ukrainians into submission or terrorize them to the point where Zelensky will seek some sort of negotiated arrangement. But I think that Ukraine has suffered so many atrocities, so many attacks over the past seven or eight months that these loitering munitions, which will have a terror impact, but not much of a practical impact, uh, is that's just not gonna be enough to bring the uh, Ukrainians to the negotiating table. And then of course, there's the final observation, and this is probably something Mike would wanna talk about, but. Uh, the, the final observation I have is uh, how could we, the United States and our European partners, continue to think, continue to engage with Iran in Vienna over the JCPOA talks? The idea that Iran and its interlocutor during the talks, Russia, can be seen as credible, genuine, or trustworthy partners considering everything that's going on, I think is nonsensical. And the sooner we wake up and realize that we can't continue these talks, I think the better for not only the Middle East, but also indirectly for Ukraine as well. Thanks, Luke. I can just make two quick points. One is I noticed after the Karabakh war in Europe, there was huge interest in 
the drone component of that war, I can imagine the Ukraine will be that only exponentially more. And the second is, I suppose there is an argument to be made that Putin's trying to freeze out the Ukrainians because this campaign is taking place in the run up to winter. And if he can hit enough civilian infrastructure, perhaps he thinks he can break the Ukrainians. But um, with that, um, let's go to Mike Duran. Um, Mike, should we be uh, negotiating the JCPOA with the Iranians? Um, are you pro or anti-engagement on that front? Um, well, uh, traditionally I've been anti-JCPOA, uh, but um, after listening to John and Luke, I, I thought maybe I'll reconsider my position. And uh, I, I reconsidered it, and I have decided that I'm still um, anti-JCPOA. The, the, um, it, it really is you know, a, um, amazing to me, truly amazing, uh, that they admitted to the pursuit of the JCPOA, right? They have, they have moved it a little further away. If you're listening to their, um, to their messaging, they're now saying, well, we're not actively trying to resurrect it right now, but they, so they've uh, they, they've just kind of set it off into the distance. But they're they're not making any move to uh, uh, to uh, to uh, go for snapback in the United Nations. So to reimpose the JCPOA, um, even though the administration came out and said that the provision of drones to Russia uh, represents a violation of UN Resolution Two Two Three One. That's the UN resolution that endorsed the, the, the JCPOA. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves why. Why are they not, uh, why are they not considering this? Um, and I, I think there are, um, there are uh, two and a half major reasons why. Um, the one reason, very simply, is that they fear, um, and this is, a, I think, a practical concern that we all have to take seriously. Uh, they fear that if they reimpose the JCPOA, it will lead to a very serious um, escalation between the United States and Iran, or it could lead to that. Um, also between Iranian proxies and the Americans and American allies in the Middle East. And at a moment when the U.S. military is focused on a war in, in, uh, in Europe and on tensions um, around Taiwan in the, in the Pacific with China, the, the last thing they want is an escalation in the um, in the Middle East. And they truly believe, uh, the Biden administration truly believes that their pursuit of the JCPOA um, and better relations with, with Iran has reduced tension um, uh, in the Middle East. And they would point among themselves, not so much to us, but among themselves, they would point to something like the maritime uh, agreement between Lebanon and Israel that they just brokered. That was basically a, an agreement between Hezbollah and Israel brokered by the United States. And, and in their mind, that was a great success. And it, and it came about, again, in their mind uh, because of this uh, uh, de-escalation of tensions with, um, uh, with Iran. I'm going to come back to that in one, in one second. Um, the second major reason why they don't want to reimpose uh, sanctions on Iran is that they, have, um, they don't want to take Iranian oil off the international market. The Iranians are uh, providing oil, especially to the Chinese. Uh, and uh, if they take that oil off the market, they fear that it will raise oil prices, uh, and they're uh, very sensitive to that. Of course, technically, they haven't uh, relieved sanctions on Iran. All the sanctions are still on the book, books, and technically, they are enforcing the sanctions. But in fact, there's been a kind of soft, um, uh, there's been a kind of soft uh, um, uh, um, removal of sanctions by the by the regime through non-enforcement and in particular uh, non-enforcement of the uh, of the deliveries of uh, of oil to China the half reason why they're not um, uh, the half reason why they're not doing this it goes back to what I uh, what I was talking about a moment ago that is that they believe that their Iran policy has reduced tensions in in the, in the Middle East this is a belief uh, among progressives in particular, but I think probably even among Biden and his and his team, um, that belongs uh, up there with um, uh, with uh, transition to renewable energy um, as a kind of 
uh, you know, a belief in climate change and it being the defining or uh, existential issue of the day, the the belief that there is that they have an alternative approach to dealing with Iran and one that is far superior to the Republican approach is an article of sort of self identity for them. So for them to get rid of that and say and go go back go uh, essentially adopt Donald Trump's maximum pressure uh, policy is just is just hard because in their minds that's not who they are and that's not and and that's not who they should be uh, mike maybe i can stay with you real quick and and um follow up on the jcpoa to what extent do you think the jcpoa represents a backdoor for the russians to try and escape some of these harsh sanctions that have been put on them i mean it, is it does it represent an escape hatch in, in your mind i mean can you channel a lot of Russia's entry and exit to the world markets through Iran and what the JCPOA would represent, or is that an overwrought and uh, an interpretation of what it would mean? Oh, no, I, I I don't think that's an overwrought in, in interpretation. But I would um, I would I would personally make the argument more in terms that I like I was just making it a second ago. The uh, the JCPOA. The, the the underlying assumption of the JCPOA is that Russia, China, and the United States and Iran all have common interests. The, the, the vision that Obama had when he came up with the JCPOA was that the United States, Russia, and Iran were all going to work together to stabilize the Middle East. We're going to bring Iran into the uh, into the security architecture um, of the Middle East. The theory of the the theory of the case is that um, Iran has developed these missiles and drones that we're we're talking about um, as primarily defensive weapons, which it is going to use uh, out of fear of regime change. Uh, that the uh, uh, that the terror the terror weapon the 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 support for terrorism that it engages in is just a way of getting pressure over the international system. And if we'll come and reach out to Iran and take its interests seriously and negotiate with it like a normal power, it will then behave like a normal uh, like a normal power. That's very much in the belief system of uh, um, of the progressives and of Barack Obama. And I think you know, and Barack Obama's team that put together the JCPOA is the is the um, is the Biden team. So I think we're seeing it in Ukraine as well, Peter. I mean, in my read, I don't know if you agree with this, but my read is, I mean, you have to ask a question. Here, Iran has rushed to Ukraine, rushed to, to the Russians' uh, assistance in Ukraine and given them drones. Why hasn't the United States rushed in, uh, to Ukraine in, um, uh, in response or even before this and given Ukraine drones? Uh, we're quite happy to have our systems targeted by Iranian drones, but we won't provide the Ukrainians with drones. My answer to that question, again, I don't know if this is your answer. My question, my answer is they want a balance, they being the White House, the Biden administration. It wants a, a balance between Ukraine and Russia. It doesn't want a total defeat of Vladimir Putin. It wants Putin to lose uh, in terms of uh, the war, in terms of not gaining what he wanted to gain, and they want him to go away with his tail between his legs, but they want the negotiated settlement, and they're afraid of arming the Ukrainians to such a point that the Ukrainians will win too decisively. Um, and that's because they have never, ever lost, uh, they have never, ever lost the view that somewhere, uh, you know, that Russia can be a partner to the United States in some way, or at least Maybe partner is the wrong word. We can reach a strategic accommodation uh, with with Russia. I don't think they've given up that idea. They haven't given up the idea that we can reach a strategic accommodation with Iran. Be friction, yes, it'll be difficult. But the way I see the world is that Schmidt against the American system. They are all enemies of America. The war in Ukraine has been very defining in that it has shown that to us clearly, and we should behave in accordance with that. Doesn't mean we have to go to war with all of them, but we should be taking much more um, uh, aggressive actions to punish behavior like the the supply of drones to uh, uh, to, to Russia. I agree with uh, our colleague John Kasapolu that this is a number nine 
uh, on a scale of one to ten of uh, you know geostrategic shocks that should that should lead to a change in worldview, but it hasn't. I'm your moderator, so I will pass that question on to Luke Coffey and say, how do you answer it? What do you think is um, ultimately the American thinking behind the problem of Iran supplying Russia with drones? And um, why do you think the Americans have hesitated, not in potentially sending certain air defense systems, but, um, but in some of the more advanced uh, drones? Well, the White House would love for this whole problem to go away because it's still desperate to get some sort of uh, deal with Iran. Let's not forget that this was one of the major, if uh, the only uh, major foreign policy uh, issue that Biden really campaigned on, uh, this idea of uh, getting a new deal with Iran. So I think, as Mike said, there's still a certain amount of desperation in the White House for a deal with Iran. And it knows if it pushes just too hard on a certain area, whether it's um, Iranian drones in Ukraine or Iranian proxy backed drone attacks against US forces in Syria, then it could create problems for the negotiations in, in Vienna. As it pertains to Ukraine specifically, I, I largely agree with Mike's assessment. It, it's, it's as if, uh, and Peter, I, I've heard you mention this many times before, it, 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 it seems that the Ukrainians have to suffer uh, at, at some extreme level uh, or suffer some sort of defeat on the battlefield before they can unlock the next level of U.S. assistance. Uh, and we should have been providing the Ukrainians with uh, advanced drones or advanced air defense systems from the very beginning of this conflict. And instead, we are spoon feeding the support for Ukraine, uh, giving them a, just enough so that they cannot lose, but not enough for them to win. And we have to start wanting Ukraine to win more than we hope that Russia will lose in Ukraine. And until we make that adjustment in our policies, we're gonna see this war, uh, I fear, drag on even further. You have some who, some critics of US support to Ukraine say that we're prolonging the war by providing weapons. Well, I would say we're prolonging the war by not providing enough of the right kind of weapons to Ukraine. Uh, we can bring this war to an end even sooner. And also we can, you know, Iran and Russia are partners. So uh, a defeated or a weakened Russia will indirectly mean also a weakened or uh, damaged Iran to a certain extent. So we have to start seeing these uh, issues as being connected because Russia and Iran certainly see these issues as being connected. And let's take this uh, geopolitical emergency from a nine to a 10 by asking you, what else could the Iranians provide the Russians? Uh, we mentioned missiles at the outset, the title of our event hits Iranian drones and missiles. Can you talk a little bit about the state of the Iranian missile program and to what extent you expect Iranian missiles to show up on the battlefield as well? And then second, uh, if I could add to that, uh, how complex is it to build and manufacture and put together these sorts of systems, be they drones, or some of the more rudimentary Iranian missiles. Is the threshold for offensive action and troublemaking in the world vastly lower than it was years ago? Meaning, are we gonna see a proliferation of bad actors having access to really dangerous technologies in the future? Should Seoul begin to worry about North Korean drones hovering over it? Of course, we've seen examples of this in the Gulf uh, in recent years and elsewhere. Um, so maybe you could tackle those two real quick. Well. Starting from the, the last one, I think we have, I don't want to be the, the, the military pessimist here, but we have each and every reason to, to be afraid because of three reasons. First, uh, when an actor reaches a critical mass in generation production and mass production of such technologies like, like the Iranians did, and especially when they can have direct feedback, uh, in, which is in military terms, lessons learned from actual combat situations. Like it was really important for the Iranians to harvest data and pertain it to further uh, weapons design and weapons production from Yemen, from Syria, uh, from, from the hostile actions of the Lebanese Hezbollah uh, and, and Iraq. Uh, then then generating that kind of technology is, is really easy. Uh, the, the second 
the second pillar that that should make us more concerned is if an actor can navigate legally or through smuggling in high technology market, uh, especially if it can it, it can enable uh, access to critical subsystems like navigation systems, like microchips, uh, uh, like cameras, like sensor systems. Uh, actually, it can it can assemble a really dangerous, disruptive military technology that cannot be easily intercepted by our conventional uh, air and missile defense systems. This is why open source intelligence assessment also showcase some Western systems, including American systems and European subsystems in Russian missiles, for instance. Uh, really important uh, subsystems I'm talking about here, like the uh, mission computers of famous caliber missiles that started its combat uh, record back in 2015 in Syria. The Russians combat tested it there. And now these missiles from both uh, the Black Sea Fleet and also from the Russian proper and Belarusian territory, they are pounding the, the Ukrainian soil. Uh, first, these systems were developed by actual combat record uh, in light of lessons learned from the Syrian, uh, from the Syrian conflict. And because the Russians could navigate illegally, uh, and also to some extent legally in dual use high technology market, uh, they, they were able to, and still they're able to have some Western components, some critical Western components in, in, their, uh, in their systems. It is, it is also the case for the Iranians. So we have each and every reason uh, to be worried about the North Korean, not even North Korean, not even state actors, the Lebanese Hezbollah drone proliferation. The Lebanese Hezbollah is not only right now an off the shelf customer of Iranian military solutions, but also the Iranians are, are helping its, its uh, network to copy these kind of technologies and to develop some kind of you know, uh, production capacity. I, I call it the revolutionary guards copying its DNA, this, this disruptive DNA uh, in, in other parts of the world. Uh, but we have just another reason to, to be afraid of. To, the Iranians are not only transferring weapon systems to proxies and now in the case, in this case, Russian Federation. Also the, the, the operational art or concepts or operations, if you like, that using drones, loitering munitions, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles in one single strike package. This is dangerous because the, the common theory, I'm trying to simplify everything here in civil terms, but the, the common theory was about overwhelming the interceptors. So I'm gonna throw five missiles or five like projectiles onto you. And if you have three interceptors, then I'm gonna overwhelm you at least by, by two remaining projectiles. The real threat, the real underlying threat by the Iranian concepts or operations or mixing up everything else in the same strike package is overwhelming the sensor system. Because these, these weapons have very different and distinctive flight paths and, and trajectories. So you have cruise missiles with high maneuvering you know, features and you have drones and loitering munitions with very low radar signatures and, and the ground clutter and you have ballistic missiles that have perpendicular uh, homing uh, trajectories. And if you mix up all these within the same strike package, it is, it, it is just like the analogy or mixed martial arts when, when you combine the low kicks, grappling, striking, and everything to overwhelm simply the, the, the sensor technology of, of your opponent that he doesn't know how and when and where you're, you're gonna strike. So that's uh, that. That's the real danger, and the real the, the, the what also worries me is that not only the Ansarullah militia or Yemen or uh, or, or uh, other proxies in the Middle East, but also the Russians started to use uh, that kind of operational art. So copying that that uh, that subversive DNA is is no good news for uh, for the transatlantic strategic community. When it comes to your first question, what else can we see on the battleground as the Russians? deplete their missile and, uh, and uh, uh, the air ground munitions arsenal in this high tempo war because they, they never were prepared for 
year-long conflict. They were, they were getting ready for the Gerasimov doctrine, political warfare, gray zone operations, and they were actually gearing up at the very outset of this campaign. They were gearing up for a repetition of 2014 Crimea. It is an intelligence uh, blunder. It, it, it deserves further attention and maybe another, another round like this. But as they deplete fast their stand of arsenal and because their frontline combat formations are not performing well against, against Ukrainian defensive and now counteroffensive, they will rely more and more on the Iranian solutions. And what comes into play, what might come into play here is also Iranian short range solid fuel uh, ballistic missile systems, which is the Fatih 110 family, uh, which goes by Fatih uh, 313 and the Zulfikar missile. Again, in very simplification, why that should bother us and why this is a direct threat uh, to, uh, to Ukraine? First, because of the, 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 the uh, mixed strike packages that I was talking about, like if the Russians also mix uh, like the Yemeni Houthi militia did the Iranian drones and Iranian ballistic missiles and Russian cruise missiles, that would really stress uh, the, the Ukrainian defenses to a very worrying uh, extent. Uh, and also these missiles are road mobile uh, systems. So Ukrainians hunting them down in the Russian territory or deep Ukrainian territory uh, invaded parts will not be easy because we are talking about mobile transporter erector launchers. Uh, they are solid fuel systems, which means that their launch cycle is really minimized. Uh, so they can get ready for a full uh, salvo in less than 30 minutes. Uh, and I, I, I recall Saddam Hussein's uh, missile forces uh, taking the Soviet missiles and, and minimizing the launch cycle in an unprecedented fashion. I think the Russians can do even better than, than the Iranian proxies in the Middle East. So that's another reason. Uh, and lastly, these are combat proven systems. Uh, so we know their performance and we know their, their uh, combat effectiveness. Uh, and I think that should, as, as a final sentence, and I think as a self-criticism of the transatlantic strategic community, maybe including my past publications, we used to consider Iranian missile proliferation to be a strategic weapons development effort and as a way for compensating for conventional shortfalls of the Iranian armed forces. It, it appears that it is not. Uh, we are not talking right now about long range strategic missiles like Sechil 2 but we are talking about battlefield use assets, short range ballistic missiles with a very low CEPs, which means that they are, they are really high precision systems and they are not static deterrence waiting in missile silos. They are actually deployed in, 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 the, in the battleground starting from 2017 Iranian attack in Darzor, Syria. Uh, so their combat record is pretty solid. Remember uh, when the, the reports came out that the Russians were asking the North Koreans for, uh, for ammunition and the Chinese for Meals ready to eat. System. There was a lot of contempt and and uh, and sneering at that. You know, no great power goes to to, to smaller regional players like the like their North Koreans and Iranians for support. But but I think uh, they've turned out to be quite important um, on the battlefield. Mike, um, if I could go to you, um, it's hard to have a discussion about Iran um, at this moment without at least brief mentioning domestic tumult that has grappled the country, gripped the country. Um, is there uh, any way of, of, um, of thinking through the connection between domestic unrest and external expansion? Are there opportunities there for Western policymakers? How should we think about that? Or are those really kind of two indistinct, distinct lines of, of observation and effort? At, um, uh, uh, no, I think they're. Uh, uh, I think I think they're related. But uh, and I'll answer your question in one second. But let me just point out that uh, again, um, how um, perverse is a word I would use? Um, the U.S. policy is of pursuing the JCPOA, um, uh, even this kind of non-pursued pursuit um, in the face of what we're seeing, which is the um, the export 
of these weapons to uh, uh, to Russia to Ukraine, while the repression of these um, uh, of these protests is going on uh, is it, it, going on at home. Uh, President Obama has now expressed uh, some regret, or um, uh, at least um, uh, words that can be taken of expressions of regret for not having supported the Green uh, Movement in 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 in, in two thousand and nine. Uh, so. Uh, uh, let's go back to a policy of putting pressure on the regime and raising costs uh, for it on everything that it does. I mean, that's uh, I think um, that's a very simple logic um, that's hard that's hard to escape right now. But look, the regime, uh, by its nature, uh, when it feels threatened, uh, becomes more threatening. And you can see it right now. Not only is it not only is it helping the Russians in Ukraine, it's carrying out an exercise right now on the border of Azerbaijan, uh, where it's got uh, 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 tens of thousands of members of the IRGC, no less, who you think would be a little bit taxed right now with all of the uh, with everything that's going on. Uh, they're carrying out an exercise on Azerbaijan's borders. I do believe that that is directly related uh, um, to the uprising that's going on in the country or the, the protests, however you want to define it. Um, the, as, the ethnic Azerbaijanis make up between one fifth and one third uh, of the entire population of Iran. Uh, the Iranians are sending, among other things, are sending a message um, uh, to the Azerbaijanis that they should not think of meddling or any other outside power should not be think of meddling in uh, Iranian affairs at this particular moment. Don't think that we're weak, we're not, we're very strong. Um, in addition, uh, that they are threatening the Azerbaijanis right now uh, because it looks like um, Azerbaijan and Armenia might actually sign a, a peace agreement. Uh, at least there's a there's a there's a possibility of it. If not a peace agreement, uh, they might move forward on uh, 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 in in the direction of normalizing relations by, for example building the Zangazor corridor. This is a transport and um, uh, uh, a transport and economic corridor between Azerbaijan and its exclave of Nakhchivan, on, which, uh, which sits on the other side. You know, think of the United States and Alaska. Uh, part of uh, Azerbaijan is not connected to Azerbaijan. It's separated by Armenia. And uh, the um, agreement that ended the war in, uh, in 2020 called for building this corridor across, uh, um, uh, across Armenia. Iran is, is hostile to this corridor for all kinds of reasons. In the past, it could rely on the Russians to shut it down, to make sure it didn't happen. The Russians are busy right now and they're weak. Uh, and so Iran is kind of moving into the uh, moving into the breach here. So um, uh, traditionally, the Russians have not wanted to uh, engage with Iran on any in, in anything to do with the South Caucasus uh, uh, in, on security matters uh, because the Russians regard that as their backyard. Um, but the two of them share a desire to keep Turkey out of the uh, you know to weaken Turkey in the um, uh, in the region. Uh, and so I think uh, this is one area where you can see uh, a direct connection between Iran's support for Russia and the war in Ukraine um, and the um, and the turmoil um, uh, at home in uh, in Iran, uh, because it um, it raises fears in Iran, in, in Tehran and in Moscow that Turkey and Azerbaijan might get stronger, more influential in the South Caucasus, and then and push Iran and and um, uh, and Russia back, and that the the weakness of Iran at home because of its uh, Azerbaijani minority might be one of the mechanisms by which they kind of push the uh, um, the, the the Iranians back. That's just one. That's just uh, um, one area. Of course, the Iranians also want to send a message to the Israelis uh, that uh, um, uh, that they are going to. Uh, that they are going to combat any attempt to influence the domestic politics uh, aggressively. You saw uh, the Iranians right immediately when the when these protests broke out. Of course, they started um, uh, because of the uh, the the murder by the regime of uh, of a young Kurdish woman, um, and almost immediately the Iranians shot ballistic missiles and drones into, into, uh, uh, into Iraqi Kurdistan. That was, among other things, 
to send a message uh, uh, that uh, to any uh, any of the external actors that they weren't going to uh, they weren't going to uh, tolerate any intervention into their domestic politics. Mike and uh, I know Luke had in his latest piece for Arab News, where he's a columnist, uh, a recapitulation of the Azerbaijan Armenian diplomatic talks that are ongoing. Um, uh, since we're we're running low on time, Luke, maybe I could ask you with a question that I think always has to be asked at these um, sorts of roundtables and um, matters most, which is what would you recommend um, if you were sitting in the Oval Office, or let's just make you president, um, so you can strip all of the ideological pretensions or preferences or proclivities of the administration away, how would you tackle this issue set of, you know, the Iranian drones, the kind of of the region and you have about you know two minutes to yeah do it. no no problem at all very uh, easily done I, I would view uh the, the the geopolitical space between the scandinavian peninsula and the arab peninsula as one common air defense zone that is both uh under threat now from iranian uh, air uh, air threats so we have to use our convening authority as the united states of america to bring all of our partners together to find common solutions and best practices to deter and ultimately defeat this Iranian drone threat. Whether it's a, an Iranian drone uh, attacking the center of Kyiv or whether it's a, an Iranian drone used by an Iranian proxy attacking US soldiers at Al Tamf, we have to work with our partners in the region and with, with industry and with our military planners uh, across the board, like I said, from Scandinavian Peninsula to the Arab Peninsula, to, to find the best way to defeat and deter this, uh, this threat. Uh, and we, we have to see all of these issues as being interconnected because they are. And Russia sees them as being connected. Iran sees them as being connected. Uh, we have to see them as being connected. That's great. And on that, that rousing note, um, thanks so much for joining us today on uh, Hudson.org. If you want to learn more about John, Mike, and Luke's work, please visit uh, their expert pages, which is tabbed at the top of your screen. Um, if you're on YouTube, you can always navigate again to Hudson.org, and we look forward to seeing you on uh, future webcasts. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.